So you've grown uh, your revenues from yeah. five crores to around four hundred crores of uh, run rate. We've not, you know, um, you know, we're pretty under the radar as a company, and you know, the first podcast we've managed to get me on with. Now it's the company has grown uh, to a next level. But early days, how was that for you? Because that was, I think, yeah. that's the time where a lot of struggle is. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very hard. Yeah, like you know, I imagine, yeah, you know, most people like. And plus, you left a job. Yeah, easy thing. correct. Uh, it was paying you around uh, and, and, more than a CR. And paying in uh, paying in dollars. I think that was the key point. Um, it was tough. Like you know, a coming back, like giving up that salary and like that you know that life and coming back to India, starting the business with twenty lakhs okay. of capital. Uh, but I think it took us two three years. Uh, so if I look at our company, it's been six years, three years we were bootstrapped. Huh. We're not raised any money. Uh, so we, that, you know, being capital efficient and having to be profitable was the survival requirement. Yeah. That was the worst thing. <laughs> and how are US markets different uh, from? I think US markets are very different than offline. Like you know, I think if people starting out, you don't have to take VC money. You know, I don't understand like why that's such a yeah. draw. Um, you should first assess if you need external capital. Sometimes you don't need external capital. If investors had access to so much capital, they had to deploy it, and the only thing that mattered was growth. Investors were pushing their founders to grow. Founders also wanted to grow and had suddenly said, like, "Okay, capital is not a constraint. I can grow as much as I want." And dilution is not a problem because I'm able to raise at insane valuations. So, so Dwaril, uh, I heard a lot about you from my friend Sashank and Tushar. So I was like, "Things." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was like, "No, I, I want uh, Dwaril on the podcast." So they told me something. So you grew your company's revenue from five crores in financial in nineteen to around. Four four hundred crores of run rate by financial year twenty three. So that amazed me because I come from a background where I've not seen such kind of growth. So wanted to and uh, get you on this podcast. So how did C A Dhanil uh, went into entrepreneurship and saw this amount of growth? Uh, what was your journey like? Yeah, uh, no, firstly thank you for having me. Um, but and you know, um, so I, I so I think you hit upon like I I I was initially like you know like you I was a C A. Um, you know, did my articleship. Uh, you know, standard things. Um. Post my CA, I was lucky to get to work at you know BCG uh, at the time. You know, consulting didn't typically hire CAs as much. You know, it was a lot, uh, it was a lot tougher to get in. Uh, the typical talent pools that they went after were you know IITs and you know uh, IIMs. Um, so you know, was fortunate to break through, get into BCG. Um, worked in consulting for a little over three years, and honestly loved that experience. Um, um, you know, I, I, I've always even now like when I talk to people, I think if you can get a good consulting experience at the start of your career, it's like a great finishing school. Yeah. Right, um, and um, at least in my experience at BCG, I got to work across what four or five countries, um, and uh, you know I started in the Bombay office, but then you know spent time in Japan, Sri Lanka, and then US, Canada, um, and so that was that was like sort of my journey. Uh, while in consulting, I did predominantly like you know I would say projects in in more consumer facing sort of uh, projects, right? So whether they were even financial services, or they were like more like you know consumer oriented, like you know. Like you know, what's the right home loan product to you know uh, compete with you know some of the existing players, or uh, what's a great strategy to create a digital bank, or uh, but what I really really like um, enjoyed was my stint in the U.S. and Canada. There we worked a lot with like retailers, and this is I would say twenty, um, fourteen, yeah, no, fifteen, sixteen, yeah, around then, and um, and and a lot of the retailers there, whether it was in the U.S. and Canada, had this question around like what should our strategy be to compete digitally, right? Like you know, there's a threat of online marketplaces. There's a threat of uh, some of the larger brands going direct. There's a threat of consumers preferring to buy online, and so um, a lot of the work for literally one over a year was just centered around this. And um, at that time, I think direct to consumer or this was not really as um, I would say prevalent as a business model or um, as much as like you know as it was back then. It was quite new as a concept, and um, I think what really interested me was that. While there were a lot, like while there were a lot of people trying to do D two C and kind of you know selling online, I, I think no one had tried to basically do this globally. That yeah. can you basically uh, build a business where uh, you can take advantage of you know India's structural advantages that we have, yeah. whether that's you know strong manufacturing in certain categories, uh, you know huge cost arbitrage mm-hmm. in terms of team and, and people, yeah. um, and and at the same time leverage digital channels mm-hmm. to actually build out your brand, targeting a global market. And um, and I think the way I saw it was that you know. Technology platforms had solved a couple of things, right? One, they had solved the ability to distribute your products to consumers anywhere in the world, right? Um, and then the second thing they basically solved was, you know, your ability to communicate your message. What does your brand stand for? What do your products stand for? Why are they different? Why should a consumer give it a shot? All of these things, like twenty years ago, could not be done. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, I think that really excited me. Um, and um, obviously, I was a lot younger, and I didn't think it now. You know, I just uh, look. I frankly come from a very like traditional Gujarati background where. You know, starting a business is sort of a 
um you know <laughs> rite of passage that everyone <laughs> in my family goes yeah. through um and um, and look this idea made a lot of sense is is like if you can take advantage of india's adva- uh, you know structural advantage but target global markets okay. it would be inherently a very very strong business model mm-hmm. and i had seen this even in my early days like you know when i was talking about my ca days i used to article at um, at uh, deloitte and i worked mm-hmm. with a lot of it services companies yeah, i think that's how india yeah, yeah. i mean that was the original i would say tech boom if you were so yeah. to speak right and those guys have built 100 billion dollars sort of plus businesses yeah. uh, but the fundamental of that business model is india cost us price right right like that's the essence of the model and um you know he he one could kind of replicate that in say consumer which historically was not possible yeah. um given the sort of lack of digital infrastructure it could be a really exciting idea and that was really what i you know got excited by um and um you know i moved back to india i quit my job at bcg um they were very supportive in the saying that they you know if it doesn't work matlab hum wapas le lenge uh um the me the category you know as i thought about it it was not like i had some deep pain point that i was going mm. to solve it was i sort of approached the whole thing quite analytically to say that you know what categories are going to move online uh, in a disproportionate manner and 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 um, like for example like you know a lot of categories are moving online in terms of consumption but some of them have structural issues right i mean you talk about say fashion huge market people buy it online but you know you're plagued with high returns you know you're there's some structural problems that you know difficult to solve i'm not saying not solvable but they exist um but like you know what i liked about like you know children's products in general is that you know a the um, you know as that category moves online the the decision making is then done squarely by the parent or the adult yeah. whereas in a retail environment the child can influence the purchase and therefore a lot of the brands historically have been geared to cater to that shopping environment and therefore you never had a sort of an education first consumer brand like skillmatics yeah. right uh, because you know with that but that need on a, in a, in, a, in an online environment made a lot of sense because um uh, you know parents are looking for high quality learning resources that are um you know not plastic uh they're not um you know they're not they're not digital they're not easily adding yeah. to the screen time of their kids yeah. um and so we thought that there was a great white space and um and came back started the company called grasper global grasper because you know kids grasp and learn concepts and global because really genuinely from day one uh we had a very a very clear idea that we have to build this out globally uh and that was the vision of the company you know it's not that you know because we're global today i'm saying it it was really the um the the ethos of the of 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 how we got started yeah so so what kind of products uh, now uh, you sell under skillmatics what are, yeah. are those products and what uh, tg you have like, yeah. what are the age group you are targeting yeah so i i uh, i get the question so like when we started um skillmatics initially started making learning resources and um i would say a supplementary educational aids for children in the 3 to 6 age group which was the preschool segment um as we continue to um you know sort of grow we've now expanded into i would say so the way we look at it is sort of age groups and then product categories right so now we have products starting for like children as young as 1 up to maybe 10 11 years of age um so we can sort of have different product lines targeting um you know sort of uh, segments in the market as like you know from infant all the way to like you know 10 11 12 in terms of product categories we you know we have innovative like learning resources uh, we have um, a, a large product portfolio of educational games um we have now expanded into art and craft um uh, puzzles and so i think the idea is that you know we continue to expand our uh, stem products um uh, the idea is that the the what we're building towards is that skillmatics is a destination right so whether your child is 1 or 8 whether they whether they're you know into art or whether they're into puzzles or whether they're into like games you'll find high quality content rich products uh you know in our portfolio uh and we've been lucky to have had like you know a reasonable amount of success uh on sort of the product development um and i think that what we've done which is different is we've tried to make products which are very content rich because you know while the global market sounds exciting the problem is ki itna competitive hai yeah. then if you try and do anything commoditized mm-hmm. you know you will never be able to like compete with say like chinese manufacturers mm-hmm. right or even if you do your margins will be quite bad right and if you and and, then, and that's on one end on the other end you have like big brands you know who have like established a trust with the consumers so the only way we thought that we could differentiate is to have innovative concepts that are fundamentally differentiated and like So an example is like say Guess and 10 and Guess and 10 is one of our best selling games. It's fundamentally different like there can only be one of it right we own the trademark we own the copyright like it's like one of one. Mm-hmm. And so if that succeeds you know it allows you to grow disproportionately. Yeah. Um so that's been sort of our approach to products and uh kind of what's worked till date. Yeah. Got it. So as you mentioned uh, uh till now we so even in India we are consuming a lot of brands which are western. Yeah. Still now we are I think maximum share is by them. Now building a brand from India for global is of course big. uh as we say in uh, uh, we build in inr and sell in dollars so yep. of course the cost arbitrage whatever advantage how are your products like from ideation stage to the final product stage are being are being built um so i don't think it's as much about cost arbitrage mm-hmm. right because uh, frankly most all large global companies also outsource manufacturing to aisa nahi hai ki 
in fact i would say that we manufacture 100% in india so i would say that you know we may even have a higher cost structure if you know versus say you know if you're manufacturing that i don't know, i think now is getting quite yeah. equally competitive um i think again like i think touched upon this in my last answer i i i think we try and make innovative products right products that are different um and are based on content so the ip that what you're selling is something which is um it's almost like the the content is the hero like the idea is the hero and so because of that um you're able to differentiate and stand stand apart um i think the other thing that allows you to do is 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 typically have higher gross margins yeah uh because you're differentiated correct um and and i think the last thing that we do is we you know kind of develop this product development cycle which has two unique characteristics one um we try and develop products more from what we see consumers searching for and trying to distill insights on like what could be gaps in the market i think it's a very digital first dna now i don't think we are the only people who know how to do this i think a lot of like you know digital first e-commerce brands are also doing the same thing but uh you know you're you have access to so much data now that you can really clearly see what are the gaps in the market right and um analyzing that and we have a separate analytics team which only does this and tries to find like white spaces for us to come up with something innovative whether there's like an unmet consumer need or there is a consumer need which is not being met as efficiently um and uh, and i can make this a little more concrete like so for example when we you know when we developed when we got into educational games you know what we did is we said that okay let's not invent a game mechanism there are a finite number of game mechanisms that exist so think of like balancing sorting guessing like jenga is a balancing game like you know so well like let's identify through an analysis that like, you know by age group what are the underlying mechanisms that are proven to succeed with kids like right? kids love them they find it engaging on top of that mechanism then let's add a layer of educational content so that they are learning that content or whatever skills that we want through an engagement mechanism that they like um and so therefore you know the the success rate is already kind of predetermined yeah. because you know that the underlying mechanism is is sort of uh, proven and th- that's why we use data to kind of come up with the ideas and on the back end what we do is we build a pretty agile supply chain which allows us to go from ideation to launch in 2 and 1/2 months now see kya hota in this category in particular like by and i don't want like to think of ourselves as a toy company but in that segment 90% products are plastic Now, when you make plastic products, you can't make them fast. You have to first make a mold. 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 After that, product will be made. MOQ. I mean, so yeah. And now, also, what happens is most global companies they're manufacturing it in China. They're not close to their point of production. La- la- majority of them sell mostly offline, mm-hmm. and mostly in November, December. So they have no incentive to kind of go fast and develop products rapidly, okay. right? Uh, they have to do it in a certain, almost an annual development cycle, mm-hmm. uh, because they com- they have compulsions. Because yeah. A, plastic. B, China. C, seasonality in back end. And offline retailers won't just buy whenever. Like they buy in these. mind cycle yeah spring fall spring fall like there are these cycles mm-hmm. um so what we realize is that you know we can go from ideation to launch in 2 and 1/2 months launch online get feedback and then based on what works then scale those uh, it allows us to work a lot lot faster mm-hmm. uh, and a lot more data driven um and so that's kind of like i would say the last principle with which we kind of make and develop products yeah. when we talk about your distribution channels i think you are already selling majority outside india in yeah. the us how how's that evolved over the years um so I mean obviously when we started we first started in India uh because that was the home market but obviously we quickly started you know moving global um I the US is our largest market uh, it's our core market um I would say uh, the way we segment our business is really three verticals we have North America which is US Canada which is by far the biggest yeah uh we have Europe uh which where the larger markets I would say are like UK and Germany and so on and then we have Asia Pacific and Asia Pacific we have India Australia Japan so we kind of think of it yeah. the business in these three like geographic markets um and uh, in terms of distribution channels i think while we initially started online heavy on our website on amazon uh today we basically sell across uh you know both offline and online you know mm-hmm. uh, channels uh like for example in india we sell in you know general trade we sell in modern trade we sell uh in some schools uh in the us we basically sell in like large you know independent retailers we sell in like re- large retailers like target mm-hmm. um so it's a mix uh but uh, definitely online is a larger chunk okay uh, in terms of sort of the, the split split because that's also because in a lot of the newer markets were still only online mm-hmm. so typically we start enter a market online and then build offline uh but typically to build offline successfully you need to have a local team so we have a local team in the US as well mm-hmm. right um so getting into offline channels would be difficult if you don't have an online presence already like you is, is yeah. it what you've seen that and how are US markets different uh from I think US markets are very different in offline like you know I think in two three things right one India is a completely unorganized offline market right so general trade is the predominant channel uh, you have this network of distributors distributors to retailers i mean you're everyone's familiar with how it works modern trade is actually a very small percentage um of that of the overall uh, retail landscape us is the flip there is no unorganized retail uh, everything is super organized you know you have a very very large uh, retail players and you know even the specialty players will be very large in size and store count and yeah. uh, it's a very efficient uh, sort of uh, market where um everything works in a far more systematic way whereas here it's a little more unorganized mm-hmm. um 
so I think that very different in sort of the the, the landscape. That being seen, the core principles of selling offline tend to remain the same. Uh, in terms of sort of channel margins and you know what you need to do to succeed, uh, a lot of those are actually quite similar. Um, yeah, I would say this, I would, but I do agree that you know for most new brands who are starting out, having some sort of validation digitally goes a long way in being able to establish uh, some credibility with buyers. Yeah. So the difference, I would say, the fundamental between the two channels online is a sort of a meritocratic environment mm. where the you know, best product should win. Yeah. Um, in offline, there is also these barriers, which is like you know a buyer, uh, you know, and you know they decide whether you get a shot or not, um, and. Uh, having some success online um, gives you credibility, right? Uh, at the end of the day, you know, you're pitching a product or an idea or a brand, uh, you know, some success always helps you break in. Correct. So coming to your numbers, so as I mentioned earlier, also you've grown uh, your revenues from yep. 5 crores to around 400 crores of uh, 100. Mm-hmm. What's the secret sauce behind it? There's no secret sauce, man. <laughs> uh, but the such fast growth in such, uh, yeah. uh, like four years, it's it's a big thing. Uh, no, sure. I, uh, I, I, no doubt that we're happy with the achievement and it's been amazing. Uh, but, um, I don't think there's a secret sauce per se, right? I think, uh, you know, there's a combination of a lot of factors, uh, which is no different than, again, it's not unique to us. It's like true for, I would say, any company who's had a similar uh, growth curve. I think for us, what has worked has been a couple of things. One, you know, I think we're very product-centric as a company. Mm. Like, we spend more time trying to develop innovative products that are different. Mm. That's what I think we do better than, I would say not better than somebody else, but more than that's our skill set. But you'll be involved more on that. Part. Yeah, not only me, as my co-founder right. drives the product development side um, in a much more sort of um, sort of um, you know extensive manner. But what I mean is that like, like I think some companies are very good at product. Some companies are very good at marketing. Right. You know, I'm, I'm not saying you can't be good at both. You know, you have like the apples of the world or Nike. You know, yeah. actually, I say Nike is probably better marketing company, right? Yeah. But um, I think if I had to like classify most successful consumer categories as either like you know product led or marketing led, I think we're more product led, and I think that that has been. Um, a really, really um, key element in our success, um, which is that, you know, we've tried to create products that are truly innovative and differentiated. That's the only way we could scale globally. Um, the second thing is that I, I think we've been relatively conservative and stable in our decision making. We've not, you know, um, you know, we're pretty under the radar as a company and, you know, it's the first podcast we've managed to get me on with. Uh, like, uh, we've been conservative, we've been under the radar, we've taken decisions um, thoughtfully, uh, not necessarily in a rush to that we have to grow uh, and then so we've been kind of frugal as a business and very careful with capital allocation um, which has helped us right because I, I feel like an underrated kind of quality is time the more time you spend in an industry in a category you just get better just by virtue of doing the same thing again and again and again right you're doing the same job quarter after yeah. quarter um, so I think that's been uh, something that's helped us um, but I think the biggest factor has just been our team mm-hmm. you know we've had a we've had a really solid team uh, our leadership team has been very, very consistent. In fact, you know, we've, I don't know, it's been six years now, we've had um, less than, I don't know, 10 people leave the company, uh, mm-hmm. whether voluntarily or involuntarily, either way, right? So it's been a very sort of stable team. And um, that goes a long way because, uh, you know, they also compound their understanding yeah. of the market compounds. Right. And um, I think that has helped us in a very, very big way mm-hmm. uh, to continue to, you know, do well. I would say these are things that work for us, but I mean, Nothing special. There's no secret sauce. Now it's the company has grown uh, to a next level. But early days, how was that for you? Because that was, I think, yeah. that's the time where a lot of struggle is there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's horrible. I mean, like, uh, it was, uh, I mean, uh, I would not want to go back to those days. Uh, like, it was very hard. Yeah. Like, you know, I imagine, yeah, you know, most people, like, and plus you left a job. Yeah, easy thing. correct. Uh, it was paying you around uh, and, and, more than a CR. And paying in, uh, paying in dollars. I think that was the key point. Like, you know, the, um, it was tough, like, you know, A, coming back, like giving up that salary and like that, you know, that life and coming back to India, starting the business with 20 lakhs okay. of capital. Uh, uh, you know, today also like things are different, right? I mean, today, like you start a startup, uh, we were just discussing before this, yeah. that, you know, people get like million dollars, and if you have an idea and when the product will not million dollars. I mean, I would say it's that simple, but it's, it's, what I mean is that the access to capital today for an entrepreneur uh, is so easy uh, and that's great. Right, and I think that's a good thing. But I think back then it was not so easy. Mm. Also, even if it was there, it was in these like specific like tech sectors, or you had to be in that you know IIT Bombay crew. Mm. Or, you know, uh, so like you know, we started, we didn't have access to capital. I think it took us two, three years. Uh, so if I look at our company, it's been six years, three years we were bootstrapped. Huh. We're not raised any money. Uh, so we, that, you know, being capital efficient and having to be profitable was the survival requirement. Yeah. That was the worst thing. <laughs> so actually, when we you know you mentioned we went from five to this, but what was interesting is when we were at five, we were doing sixty lakhs pat, oh, wow. you know, at five crores revenue. Um, and um, and so, you know, those days were really, really tough. There's no doubt because it was really like survival. Um, and also quite depressing, to be honest, because 
you know, you're like, what have I done? I'm giving up, you know, uh, you see, I think that the, the, the thing about professional entrepreneurs is that there's always this opportunity cost that mm-hmm. it's a very human way to think that, you know, I've given up this for this, right? And, and you know, when you're doing like, you know, the things that you need to do early on in a company, sometimes that uh, they can, it can be tough when things are not going your way. Um, so that was a really tough time. Uh, there's no, no two ways about it. Uh, I think things just, so you stayed on and persevered, like, you know, things got better. And obviously, you know, post 20, 18, 19, 19, it just started going through the roof. Got it. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, that was that was definitely not an easy time and not something I would want to go back to. Yeah, got it. So also, you raised your first money, I think, in 2019 yeah. from a VC. Tell us about how this process works. How yeah. do you decide whom to raise, what to raise, how much to raise? Yeah. I mean, again, uh, full transparency. So in 2019, I didn't even know the whole concept of VC. Um, I, you know, there were these, you know, VCs have analysts who reach out to like new companies. And so there were maybe four or five of them who reached out. We obviously went and, you know, we I had no clue, man. Like, you know, what, what do they what want? Is, like, I, like, how does this work? I was trying to be like, you know, as genuine as possible. Uh, like, I think no one gave a crap that I was making money. Uh. <laughs> I think everyone wanted to understand, like, you know, what is the potential? And I understand it a lot yeah. better now, but I was clearly pitching the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but um, I, I also didn't, I mean, I, it's not like I had the choice of who I could pick. Right, I, I also didn't speak to many VCs to be very transparent. I think we went quite, um, we had like proper conversations with, um, uh, I would say two VCs, like in in, in there, one of them being, uh, you know, Sequoia. Um, and um, and then, you know, eventually, like, you know, obviously they, they um, um, you know, they sort of said they were willing to invest and, uh, you know, honestly loved them from the time I met them. I'm not just saying it because we took their money, but I found that um, the cultural fit was great um, uh, with the people who I interacted with. Um, and then, you know, I just sort of went with it. I I also feel like, you know, in hindsight, that seed round is probably the one that, you know, that you should hurt me from, <laughs> from, from today's point. But uh, I just didn't know better, right? I mean, yeah. I didn't know like how to, like what the terms were. And, you know, obviously we took help. And yeah. um, But I, again, I think the good thing from like, an ecosystem standpoint is people have a lot more clarity now. Mm. Um, there's a lot more awareness around what are the terms. I think, again, the good thing is because we dealt with the firm like Sequoia, like, uh, you know, we got very founder friendly terms um, and so uh, thank God right? because had I not and I dealt with someone who was not that favorable I would probably have signed up for something which would have been uh, not as favorable uh, um, so I feel like but I feel like today uh, if a people starting out you don't have to take VC money you know I don't understand like why that's such a yeah. draw um, you, you should first assess if you need external capital sometimes you don't need external capital not every business requires external capital uh, you know um, and then if you do need external capital like, what is the nature of your business? What is your ambition? Do you want to make a 50 crore revenue business or make a 500 crore revenue business? Both of which are completely fine. It's what you want to do. It's your business. So, but I don't think if you want to build a 50 crore business, you should be going and taking VC money, right? So you have to um, understand what your ambitions and are and then identify like today, there's so many alternative sources of capital, right? Uh, there's th- tons of stuff. There's angels, there's angels who are not looking for that extremely like non-linear return. And so um, I think there's enough and more like information out there. But I just, it's good that there's a lot more options for people today. Uh, so, Dhanin, uh, you've been very capital efficient. So, I, I've talked about the growth numbers, but at the same yeah. time, you've been very capital efficient. You didn't use the money you have raised. Tell us about that. How much money you've raised and how much money yeah. you've actually used on that. Yeah. So, I, I think in accumulation, we've raised about $25 million oh. um, through our multiple rounds. Um, and we've, you know, I think lifetime consumed, you know, little less than $4 million. Um, and, uh, and that's like deployed in the business. Uh, uh, it's also because historically, till 2020, we were profitable. Uh, or 2021, 2021, I think we were like generating free cash. So yeah. um, it was not, uh, it was, I mean, you know, where we had raised the capital and we were raising it to invest, we were being able to earn back yeah. the money. Uh, I think now we're investing a little bit, in, you know, as we've like expanded into so many markets, there's, uh, you know, I would say there are different stages of maturity, right? Some markets are like introduction and some are, you know, in growth. Uh, we've also now started, you know, investing in building local teams. Um, so, you know, once you get to this. So this is mainly for offline. Yeah, a lot of functional, like for example, uh, you know, as you again, as you get bigger and bigger in a market, you need to start to you, you know you have to have local context and local leadership. It's not like you can run it sitting out of another country. Uh, of course, we travel. I spend a lot of time in the US and you in all, all these markets. But um, like we have a head of sales, head of brand marketing, head of product marketing, head of like social media, art, all based out of the US. We have we have local teams, right? Yeah. Uh, and primarily to drive consumer facing functions, yeah. sales, marketing, um, uh, art design. I mean, it's a creative director. So. Um, that's kind of now, you know, an area where we need to sort of just make those investments because as then we scale, hmm. um, that's sort of a um, necessary, like, investment. Investment only. Yeah. Um, I think one of the reasons we raise capital also, uh, I mean, more than we sort of have used is is just that, you know, we typically want, we, we want to, you know, have enough capital to execute our plans 
Uh, so we don't have this 18 month runway and all this standard term, like based on four or five years. But the, uh, but the idea is that like, at least me as an operator personally, I work better knowing that I don't have a, like, you know, I, I can operate at a length, length to execute a plan. Uh, when I say length, I mean like, you know, a couple of years. Cover. As opposed to like, you know, the typical most startup cycle is 18 months, you know, yeah. days, 18 months, days. I feel like, um, no, that creates it, a problem also. It makes you do short term shit, yeah. right? Because then you're optimizing for that 18 month milestone. Correct. Yeah. Which is, is, is not my milestone, right? It's yeah. like you're, you're setting yourself up to kind of, uh, these artificial kind of, uh, you know, growth number. Yeah. And so, and then you have to go back to the same investors or new investors to raise money and that causes dilution in your business. Correct. And so, I mean, you know, we still, as a, you know, founders and then team, we still own majority, yeah. you know, more of our business. And, um, it's, it's kind of been, that's been like our approach. Yeah. Um, I think the other reason is also, I mean, it's not like we don't want to use the capital. We raise the capital, yeah. we have a business plan. Yeah. Uh, we've, um, you know, we also earmarked a certain amount for M&A and acquisitions. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we had sort of brought in that capital. It's another thing that we haven't been able to find, um, you know, the perfect fit. And again, we're not going to do an M&A just to uh, announce it. just to announce and that we've run an M&A. Right? It has to be a right fit. And uh, if that means we have to be patient, we have to be patient. Yeah. Um, yeah. So coming back on the funds part, I think in uh, 2021 to 2022, there was easy, uh, like a lot of money in the market. So people have raised money crazily. Yeah. In specifically in the sector you are in, EdTech, like a lot of companies raised so much money. Yeah. They went on spending on marketing. I think IPL was being funded by them. Uh, like a lot of, uh, yeah. and you can see the change, what is now. Yeah. And they spent uh, left, right and center on acquisitions. Uh, that didn't make sense now. It, it's looked yeah. like. What do you want to say about the uh, these kind of companies, EdTech, especially especially EdTech, like who went yeah. on uh, this way? Look, I... I I don't want to um, like oh, like it's easy to like yeah. you know, uh, criticize something in a in a circumstance where some maybe you know the sector is not doing well or mm -hmm. like, I think most founders are playing by the market realities at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Like like let's be uh, like that too. So what happened in twenty twenty one is is true, right? But let's understand like some other fundamental things. The world was at zero percent, US was at zero percent interest rates. Mm -hmm. I think let's start there, <laughs> right? That is what had happened, right? Mm -hmm. That's the driving factor that led to the, all of this. Yeah. You had you had free money, free right? Money. Literally free money. Like money was coming in in droves. Mm -hmm. Um, in that environment, you know, um, investors had access to so much capital, they had to deploy it. And the only thing that mattered was growth. Mm. Investors were pushing their founders to grow. Founders also wanted to grow and had suddenly said that, like, okay, capital is not a constraint. I can grow as much as I want. And dilution is not a problem because I'm able to raise at insane valuations. Yeah. Mm. So they were playing the reality of the time, mm. right? Um, and so um, I think what people did not think about as much is that what if this changes? Yeah. Like, what if interest rates go up and like, you know, uh, this money disappears, yeah, right? Yeah. And then, so, and, and then what's happened is now, right? You have a little bit of a harder correction. People are tweaking their business models. Um, and um, look, I I think some of these things are normal. Uh, they will happen. Uh, it's a little extreme in the startup universe, yeah. uh, especially in the tech uh, sector. Like you, you see it. Um, um, but I think, look, all in all, uh, it's it's unfortunate that they had to go to such an extent where um, you know, like people are being laid off and stuff. That I think is is not great. Uh, but what I think is good is that at least. The companies that are um, in this situation are now forced to find true business models yeah. and are actually moving towards like uh, in that direction towards profit, which is again in the long run good, right? Because yeah. look, long run, at least my views, I'm bullish on the startup ecosystem. I want startups to succeed. Um, and if at all, like, you know, someone who did not have one will not, right? So which I think is, is sort of the market determining, you know, what works and what doesn't. Uh, but I definitely think that that era of like free money is... Uh, is clearly oh, no. gone uh, and I think at least uh, I mean who knows it may come back at some point and then you'll have again the same like three minute delivery or something <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I think you talked about uh, how fashion there are a lot of fashion brands in India yeah. existing from long and nobody has been able to uh, make money some might be if they're direct to consumers uh, but there have been problems mainly because over here the returns were higher and there yeah. now I think in the last few years D2C brands like the direct consumer brands that have also grown like grown crazily uh, and there's now a new model which is called as Thrasio model which was successful yeah. back in US and Similarly, we are copy pasting in India. What do you think about these uh, business models? So, I, look, I think in the fashion e-commerce is obviously a, a something that people will always attempt, right? Because the TAM is so high, oh, right? So right? It's it's, a, it's one of the largest categories, and so you know, getting to scale is actually uh, quite scaling revenue is actually not that difficult, right? Because you could sell T-shirts and do like a hundred crore revenue in yeah. India, right? I mean, um, it's just literally that big a market. Yeah. Um, the challenge with, uh, I mean, again, I'm not an expert. I don't. It's not my business. But I feel like you know, fashion, like you mentioned, has some fundamental problems. Right? It's difficult to get around. Uh, returns, uh, you have seasonality on your yeah. product, like you have to keep changing the styles and inventory. So, I mean, there are companies, frankly, that I, you know, without taking any names, who solve some of these things. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say they're the exception, not the norm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's it, By and large, it's, 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 it's a tough category to uh, uh, to be in, right? Because also there's like, you know, building a brand in is, is, is difficult. I think, again, the playing, if you could start online and then set up your own stores, mm -hmm. uh, I think that I, I think is a, is a very like viable because like, I think fashion offline retailers make money. Yeah. Right, you know, look at, you know, you know, take Indian public market comms, Sony, all of them make money. Mm. 
right whether it's something like money or us makes crazy mm-hmm. money or like trend, trend like you know anyone and they all make a um they, they all uh, they they're all completely profitable business yeah. models i think also loyalty builds up when Absolutely. you see the brand or so you go back to this yeah. or you know again and again you know, um um so i i i think starting online and then moving into an offline model with retail your own retail locations i think is a completely viable and profitable business model uh, yeah. which i think some people are doing you know the second point about like thrasio business models um again i if first i don't think it was successful in america <laughs> uh, it was successful at point in time it, uh, it's not anymore yeah. again that's a problem or a business model that was created in a 0% interest environment right where you had debt was free people were taking up debt and then buying up companies correct now the debt cost rose mm. i mean those companies didn't grow i mean it's, yeah. it's, it's quite obvious what's happening right like um i think you know building a business playing off cheap debt and is just yeah. is ridiculous yeah. right so that uh, i think that model i completely do not believe in I don't think many of the Indian players have done that. I think they've done it more for equity. Yeah. Um, personally, again, it's a subjective view, and you know, a lot of intelligent people have backed these models, and some great founders are going after it. But at least my view on this is that you know there has to be some underlying synergy. Uh, at if you are operating multiple brands, hmm. either that synergy is that you know there's a common supply chain or some common sourcing advantage. Um, like say, for example, you're running multiple fashion brands and are able to sort of have a very strong core backend yeah. catering to all of these brands, or there is like a common customer. and you're catering to the need Sorry. of that tg through multiple product lines mm-hmm. or it's the same consumer and you're just you know straddling price points mm-hmm. so you have offering like you know like a unilever does it right uh, you want this brand this brand. price point this price point this price point some ka brand there right where again the commonality is the, like this this yeah. the knowledge of the product and the supply right. chain is the same and you know what yeah. so my sense is that you know, there's nothing wrong with building multiple brands i think as long as you're able to identify some right to win mm-hmm. uh i think that 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 is makes sense i'm not sure most of the players today have that i think mm-hmm. people are just like gone bazook um again time will tell right some will work some won't but my sense is the ones who have this will tend to will tend to succeed uh, more than others yeah so so the uh, last question for this after that we go to a lightning round <laughs> so 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 a lot of people uh, would be thinking about starting something of their own till now may not have an idea and may not have a courage yeah. to start something what what suggestions would you give to them because entrepreneurship yeah, yeah, this yeah. media wise it's uh, oh it's all right well it's made a lot is a lot of it is hype right i think look, you have to uh, you have to be sure that you're in it Uh, for a long period of time yeah. you cannot say that i'm going to start something um just because it feels cool to say i'm a founder yeah. you know or i get some press coverage that i raise some money like you know, there was all the wrong reason uh, you have to clearly want to build something uh, or feel really passionate about something so i think that is the starting point frankly speak or you have a big drive to want to run a business i mean you know that very common i think that's not uncommon in a country like yeah. india where we're all maniacs effectively right like, everyone wants to start yeah. a business <laughs> uh, so i think then that's the starting point um the second thing i would say is that you know more than you know the two three things you want your idea should be like a compelling idea or something you know different because starting out especially as a startup you know you're not going to have resources so unless there's something different that you're doing hmm. um chances of you attracting capital chances of you sort of you know succeeding also like hmm. you know it's difficult to say that you're going to go up against someone who's already you know yeah. so trying to think about like something on the new age where the hair world is moving or like is it a new business model yeah. is it a new consumer category is it a new like i would uh, over on the side of newness and yeah. rather than you know uh, uh and then most importantly i would say that and again something which is the future yeah. uh the thing that's most importantly actually is get a co-founder i mean i'm in mean, a lot of lot of successful single founder businesses but i feel that having a yeah. complementary co-founder with like that skills which are completely distinct and from yours uh, goes a long way at least as in in my journey so um yeah other than it becomes a lonely journey yeah i think it's good to have a companion yeah. like you know like uh, someone who you can actually like you know uh, talk to but more so uh, i also think from an if if like effectiveness yeah. perspective right Perfect. if if you have two people who can drive different parts of the multiple parts of the business yeah you have that much more uh, strength strength right uh, especially only on yeah. Got it. So let's move to the lightning round. Okay. I'll ask you questions. Whatever comes to your mind. Sure. Uh, uh, one <laughs> advice you have to give to your younger self. One advice that I uh, have to give to my younger self. I wish I traveled and partied more rather than doing article ship and working like there's no up- absurd <laughs> hours uh, when I was eighteen and twenty years old. You know, I wish I I wish I had more fun. Yeah. One job you are terrible at. operations anything to do with like uh, sort of uh, anything to do with uh, sort of very meticulous production planning logistics uh, i had to do it at the start of the business but uh, you know uh, 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 to yeah yeah god i'm i'm not good at that <laughs> uh, recent web series you have watched or you, you have liked recent a uh, recent web series oh i saw some of the uh, i saw some of, i mean right now watching succession the new uh, season that's come out so that's pretty <laughs> phenomenal <laughs> that's that's really good yeah, yeah. Uh, what keeps you up at night just stressing about the business man like it never ends like <laughs> uh but i i would say off late my uh, my my 7th 7 month old son oh, wow <laughs> that keeps you up yeah so uh, yeah i, I think his crying keeps me up and then uh 
craziest thing you have done craziest thing i've done i can't say on the podcast <laughs> what what you can say whatever <laughs> okay i've done some adventure i've done some adventure activities like uh, i've done um, like i've done skydiving and um, and bungee jumping and like i love like adventure sport yeah i don't know adventure i like like thrills yeah. yeah you would have done in india no there is one i think no i haven't i mean i didn't know it was available yeah. i think now there is some no, there is some Uh, I mean, also I'm a little. I, I mean, I'm not sure about the whole safety <laughs> thing. I like to go to some places. Done in like it's done a lot of times. Lot of times. Uh, 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 any any book recommendations you have for that? Harry Potter. <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, that was um, that was uh, definitely the most impactful book in my life. Uh, yeah, I think it, uh, growing up, it was like a big part of uh, of growing up. But I think that in terms of like from my point, I think Shoe Dog has been amazing. It's the story of Phil Knight and Nike. Yeah. um and it focuses a lot on the early days of nike which people don't know about like you know unbelievable book for anyone who wants to build a consumer brand uh, i mean that great 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 story to learn from so last question what is success for you success for me is freedom like you know being able to do whatever you want like um uh, and um like i think like being able to spend your time how you want to spend it is success to me like if you're able to spend time how you want it whether yeah. it's your family whether it's your work um uh, i think for me that's being successful like Yeah. You know you're able to live your life on your terms on your terms. Um and you know have enough money that you can mostly do a, a, almost anything that you want. Yeah. So Got I it. would say both control over your time and you know more than sufficient resources to kind of enjoy that uh and enjoy life how you want. Um and then just generally doing something which has some sort of impact, right? Mm-hmm. Uh and that's one good thing about being in a B2C in this children. Yeah, it's like you know you feel good like Correct. you know at the end of the day like you feel good that 5 million kids today have like used my products across the world and right. And that's product has had a positive impact right. on their lives. Yeah. just feels good yeah got it got it thank you so much thank you dwarel yeah. for coming on the show awesome. and finally we were able to get you out of the radar <laughs> thank you so much great thank great you, story man. to it thank you dude thank you. bye